You know those bumper stickers that say to visualize world peace? What does that look like? When I did an online search, all the images it came up with were either vague, messy, or downright awkward. Let's see if we can do better using numbers and urban design to open the door to world peace and more. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. Now, before we begin, I need to issue a mild trigger warning. No, I'm not going to show you pictures of suffering people, although there might be a few of damaged property. It is, however, a conversation fraught with horrific statistics and incredible numbers of sad stories behind each of those statistics. Amazingly enough, even though we're talking about life and death, the numbers are very approximate all around. There's all kinds of political agendas behind inflating or deflating each of the numbers that I'll be quoting today. So we need to take the numbers with a grain of salt. None of these are definitive numbers. All of these are indicative numbers. So just keep that in mind. Let's start with a really simple definition of world peace. In my view, it's not a feeling. It's not a movement. It's just simply freedom from violence. That's it. But a 2019 United Nations report broadened my view of what world peace meant by including, in addition to war and terrorism, the violence of crime worldwide, which was, surprisingly to me, about five times bigger than war. I'm going to use these numbers as our reference point. They were a little high for their time, but the trend has been toward a little bit more violence in the last few years, so these numbers are not too far off. The question for us today is, what can we do to save human lives in these numbers or greater with urban design? This comprehensive review of all of the harms due to cars worldwide was published earlier this year in the Journal of Transport Geography. Among other things, it looked at the number of lives lost in car crashes, 1.3 million in 2019, and the number of lives lost due to diseases caused by some but not all of the various forms of pollution caused by cars. These were such things as chronic lung and heart disease caused by exposure to car exhausts. And they added up, along with crashes, to 1.7 million people in 2019. And this is a pretty typical number for recent years. The study also pointed out that car crashes are a leading cause of death for people ages 4 through 30, and that car crashes cause half of the trauma cases in pregnancy and injure 102 million people every year. Now, just to put that in perspective, this adds up to about 2 billion people worldwide who have been hurt in car crashes, or about a quarter of the Earth's population. In addition, oil, which is used for gasoline and diesel, is responsible for 25 to 50 percent of wars. Now, I know these are pretty shocking numbers, but they are also somewhat conservative numbers. If anything, the car harm study went to pains to underreport rather than overreport the numbers. And it's probably worse. According to other studies, cars cause 76 percent of U.S. trauma cases, one to two million deaths a year from pollution worldwide, and up to three million deaths a year from inactivity. Now again, these numbers are so different from the 2024 study that it gives you a real sense of how poorly known these numbers really are. In an earlier short episode, I looked into the combined harms of cars for a 50-year period between 1970 and 2019. Those were just the years that I found it easiest to get all the data sets I needed for the study. And what I found was that we had lost 182 million lives to cars in that time frame. For details on how I put all those numbers together, see the description below. And while you're there, go ahead and hit the like button and make sure you're subscribed. Our world and data has a tally of lives lost in combat in wars. Now, of course, that's not all of the harms caused by war, but their data set was fairly complete for the whole world, and so I used it as my comparison. Going back more than a century, you can see the enormous toll of the First and Second World War, followed by a fairly prolonged period of relative peace. And when we zoom in on that period, we find that only 5.2 million lives were lost to war over that 50-year period versus tens of millions in each of the world wars. Now, taking those numbers and extrapolating the terrorism and crime numbers from the UN report, I can get an estimate of 39 million lives lost to war in that 50-year period. When you compare that to the 182 million lives lost to cars, wow, cars are 4.6 times deadlier. Is there any way we could make them safer and healthier? The most obvious answer is to build better cars. Well, of course, electric cars promise to wean us off of fossil fuels, and they don't have toxic exhausts, but they are heavier due to those heavy battery packs. And the 2024 Car Harm Study mentioned that these heavier weights translate into more particulates from the tires in contact with pavement. And these particulates are a major 
component of the pollution that causes cardiovascular diseases. So with these heavy batteries, heavier cars mean more mining for metals and rare minerals, and therefore more opportunities for environmental damage and more conflicts between nations. What about self-driving cars? I mean, those have to be safer, right? Well, their safety is still unproven, and if anything, they are worse, not better, for inactivity. Because with a self-driving car that takes you door to door, you're not having to walk from a parking structure to work or to an event. So if better cars are not the answer, let's look into better urban design. Here we have three opportunities to save lives by increasing bicycle infrastructure, public transit, and through transit-oriented development. Let's start with bicycles. Bicycling is much safer than driving. In the U.S., 1% of all road trips is by bicycle, but 2% of all fatalities is by bicycle. So you might think, now wait a minute, doesn't that make bicycles less safe than cars? Not when you consider that 96% of bicycle fatalities are due to cars. If we can protect bicycles from cars through dedicated infrastructure, virtually all of the fatalities go away and bicycles end up being much, much safer. Bicycles are also healthier. They're non-polluting by their very nature. They're four times quieter, which the car harm study mentioned, but didn't end up counting in the end. The study noted that the noise due to roadways and cars can increase blood pressure, disturb sleep, and cause anxiety to the tune of some tens of thousands of deaths per year in Europe. But again, those numbers weren't included in the final tallies. And finally, and most obviously, bikes promote physical activity, which reduces cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Public transit is also a powerful tool for making cities a lot safer and healthier. As I've pointed out in this short video, public transit is 17 to 20 times safer than private cars, 10 times cheaper, making it a lot more equitable and therefore reducing the incidence of crime substantially, as you'll see in a moment. Public transit uses 10 times less material and energy than cars, which means 10 times less mining and conflict and 10 times less pollution. Very few people understand this, but public transit also promotes physical activity. Walking even just a few minutes to a bus stop or a train station quickly adds up to about 30 minutes a day or two kilometers, which is about 3,000 steps, and gets us into the range of not completely sedentary. And that can make all the difference to somebody's health outcomes. Now, promoting public transit needn't be an afterthought. It can be deeply designed into a city to great benefit. In this book and this episode, I discussed a development pattern called transit-oriented development. Cities that are entirely built for transit-oriented development reduce the pressure for conflict in many ways. First of all, removing all of that car and road infrastructure and putting in transit greatly reduces the amount of land area that needs to be dedicated to transportation and the responses to transportation, such as setbacks from the curb. This by itself can increase the density of a city fourfold, which cuts distances to every destination in half and the number of trips that you need to make in half. Therefore, taking the efficiencies that I already mentioned that public transit has over cars, we have up to 40 times less infrastructure involved in transit than in a car centric design. That translates to up to 40 times less competition for fuels, metals, and rare minerals. In addition, when you combine it with the Edenicity design, you're looking at up to 25 times less demand for land than the current system of cities plus agriculture. With that much less demand for land, we can start to restore the 50% of the land area of the earth where we've wiped out wild habitats. This will result in much greater ecological resilience, which translates to fewer diseases. There are studies that have suggested, for example, that our exposure to COVID may have been a side effect of shrinking wild habitats. And as we start to restore wild habitats, we can start to build back the 50% of Earth's living biomass that we've lost due to habitat destruction. This will greatly increase the amount of carbon sequestration in the world and eventually start to undo climate change. Let's look at some real-world examples of the effect of transit-oriented design on crime in cities. The basic concept here is less inequality, less crime. And transit-oriented design excels at reducing inequality because transit systems that are built to be useful to people at all income levels tend to reduce the harms of inequality. Los Angeles, for example, is the most car dependent of the cities on the list. And if you don't have a car in Los Angeles, your opportunities are very sharply curtailed. And it's very hard to climb out of poverty. Columbus, where I live, is a very similar story. Chicago, which is a little bit better for transit, has a somewhat lower homicide rate. New York City, even better. But cities like Vienna, which have just amazing public transit, 
have much lower homicide rates. Hong Kong has the lowest car ownership rate of any world city, and also, not coincidentally, the world's highest life expectancy. And finally, Singapore, which not only has a really great transit system, but it also has a housing policy where 90% of the citizens are homeowners, and it has very high taxes on private cars. Let's take these concepts and really run with them. Here's what the world will look like if present trends continue with no action. As far in the future as I was able to find data, that would be 2050. This is a world population that has grown from 8.1 billion to 9.8 billion, from 58% urban to 68%. If nothing changes about how cities are designed, then we would expect to lose more lives to war, terrorism, and crime just simply because there's more people and more people are in cities. If nothing changes in city design, more lives than ever will be lost to violence. Now let's imagine that all the world's cities in 2050 are Edenized. That is to say, at the very minimum, they are transit-oriented and they have no cars. For details on how this would look and how things like emergency services would look in that sort of a city, have a look at this episode. I went into it in some detail. In a world where all the cities have been Edenized, we would expect there to be half as much war because there's no oil to fight over and we're fighting over far fewer mineral and metal resources. Very conservatively, half as much war saving 55,000 lives a year. Half as much terrorism saving another 12,000 lives a year. Now this next section may seem unbelievable. 95% reduction in violent crime in cities? Yes, that's absolutely believable. We saw the actual data in actual cities in the prior slide. So that reduction in crime is going to save 360,000 lives a year. And finally, we'll take the car harms study figure of 1.7 million and multiply it by 68% and multiply it again by 94% to get the number of lives we can save through transit-oriented design. And that saves us 1.3 million lives per year. Add it up, and Edenicity saves 1.8 million lives a year, or 2.6 times as much as world peace would. But it needn't stop there. The somewhat utopian vision for Edenicity, but I think it's a very realistic thing to aim for, is an urban population of about 9.5 billion. Again, don't take the numbers too seriously. This is just to have something to discuss. These are cities that are car-free, transit-oriented, food and energy secure plus a rural population of about 500 million people. That's based on a fairly conservative estimate of carrying capacity for indigenous livelihoods. And that number could increase in the future as more archaeological evidence comes to light. But this would be the population that would be focused on restoring biodiversity and living biomass, which in many cases indigenous livelihoods naturally do. This might be done in both the subsistence context or also in collaboration with cities. But with this pattern, here's what's possible. By 2100, with a world that's fully Edenized. Now look, I'm not talking about a particular government structure. We're not talking about socialism or capitalism or any other ism. It's just that if we get on top of sound ecological design, no matter what else is going on in our lives, chances are we're going to save even more lives. The crime figure improves because more people are living in the cities and indeed, it may improve in indigenous areas, so I'm being a little bit conservative here. When you add all of this up, Edenicity saves 2.4 million lives a year compared to the status quo, which is 3.6 times more than world peace. And remember, this is not a life of sacrifice. It's a really great way to live where everything is close by and convenient, or you're living close to nature, living the traditional way, or some combination. And remember, something like this will only succeed if people basically choose it. This is not something that gets crammed down people's throats. It's what happens if we make really good choices that make us happy. So there you have it. The next time someone asks you to visualize world peace, Imagine a car-free, mixed-use, multifamily, transit-oriented, food and energy secure city. Imagine Edenicity. Take care, stay green, see you next time.